Hey, I'm Isabel Burka, and when I was 12 years old, I founded a multi-million dollar bath and body products company called De Bomb Bath. After five years of building my own brand, I've discovered a passion for helping young and innovative entrepreneurs tell their stories. Hopefully, you'll be inspired by the guests here on build biz and maybe even motivated to start a business of your own. Let's get into it. This is build biz with Isabel Burkhoff. Okay, hello everybody. Welcome back to Build a Biz. I'm Isabel Burkhaw and I'm here today with Imogen Lowe, the 22-year-old tech genius and co-founder of NewWorldOrder.ai. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Imogen. Thank you for having me on the show. So exciting. So I kind of want to start with where your passion for technology um, and tech, I'm not very tech savvy, but you know, you're just like your interest in technology and maybe like coding began. Um, and then maybe we can go from there. Oh my God. I am so passionate about it, about technology. I've had this passion since I was pretty young, but it really started to become a thing that I knew that I really wanted to do when I was in uh, late high school, like grade 11 and 12. So at the moment I'm in artificial intelligence. That's like my specialty. But I think when I was in high school, I became really passionate about computer vision. So I built out this app when I was in high school and it was this indoor positioning application. So it was like this 3D model of my high school campus when I was in grade 11 and 12. And what you could do is that you could actually use it to navigate around the school. Um, and my IT teacher saw it and he was like, this is really cool. You should enter it into a couple of competitions. So I entered into some high school competitions and it turns out that I actually won those competitions, which is so much fun. And um, it actually led me on to winning some uh, national IT awards and actually an international IT award as well. So it was really, really exciting. That's so cool. So in a way, it's almost like you were able to take this hobby that you made through high school and then um, you were able to kind of like accelerate that into the beginning of what became your career, which is so cool. Exactly. exactly. I want to hear a little bit more about the indoor uh, positioning application that you designed. Um, mm -hmm. so what, what would someone use that for, for example? So the original purpose was that when I started, when I moved to my school in grade 10, it was actually really, really difficult for me to navigate around the school. And I found that technology is this really powerful tool to solve real problems that I'm experiencing. So I thought, you know, maybe I can build out an app that actually helps me to navigate. And when I went to these competitions, I actually got a lot of really positive feedback from a lot of the judges at these competitions and they said well you don't have to use this just for schools you could use it for university campuses for hospitals for um you know um shopping malls for airports and i thought yeah this is a really great idea so i actually turned it into a, a little business when i was 17 and um i took it to taiwan i got to show it to you know some really interesting people in taiwan and it actually also landed me um a position at SAP, which is the, one of the largest enterprise software companies. Um, so they actually took my product and myself and they put me into the innovation team as a software engineer. And at the time they moved me into machine learning specifically. So that's where I picked up my love for machine learning and artificial well, intelligence. So when you moved um, internationally and then you were all of a sudden in this country by yourself because I'm assuming your parents didn't go with you um, you were in a new country by yourself um, everyone was speaking a different language and um, then all of a sudden you're working at this institution that tons of adults are working at and you have a job that some people you know are grasping at the bits to get what did that feel like to be so young in the industry and um maybe also talk to me a little bit about what it was like to be female in the industry because i know that them is constantly trying to uh pull in women because they're just oh, it's a very like male focused um profession area that's right yeah it was actually really really scary moving into you know a country all by myself i knew nobody so actually when I was with SAP, just a little, a little bit of background. So I started off working in Australia in my hometown, and then um, I got offered a position in Singapore. So I moved to Singapore um, pretty early on as well. So I was working in Singapore by myself. And yeah, that like you said, it, I, it was very, very male dominated. It was a real bros club. I was really the only female in the team. 
for a very, very long time. So it was a real adjustment that I had to make. I remember my very first day when I um, moved into the team. It was really funny. Like the very first thing that my, my manager introduced me to was not any of the team members. It wasn't my desk. It was the beer fridge. And I was like, oh, this is going to be a real bros club, isn't it? But I, I absolutely loved it. It was so much fun. And over time, we started to recruit more females into the team. That made a huge difference, I felt. Yeah, really and I feel like you're probably a, a friendly face to see. And that's really what, if people want to make change somewhere, you kind of just have to go in yourself um, and then start kind of bringing in people to what you want to do. Uh, like, for example, um, with my bath bomb business, it's kind of the opposite. It was a very like female uh, dominated, uh, you could say market. And, uh, but then we realized that my little brother, he loved taking baths as well. So then we slowly started to add more and more products and he was sort of like the advocate. And he even came home one day and was like, my friend Will wants in on this business. And uh, I gave him a 12%. And we were like, Harry, that's not how it works. <laughs> but he was really little at the time. Um, but yeah, like you just kind of got to go for it. That's really cool. And just kind of like take that first step. And I'm sure it was not only a scary experience, but in addition, it was also like a super fun experience that you had at the end of the day. And um, that's super great to hear that you were just like willing to take that step and go for it. Yeah, it was the best the best thing that ever happened to me moving overseas. I, such a cultural shock, but it, I learned so much by being over there. Yeah, seriously. Have, I know you like your, you said your parents didn't come with you. Were they on board with you moving over? Were they supportive of that? To be completely frank, um, they really just wanted me to go to uni and finish my degree. They thought, you know, this is a great opportunity moving overseas, but um, how about you just, you know, take the first step and finish your degree first? And I was like, no, I want to go work overseas. I feel like, you know, I, I, I tried going to uni, but I felt like I could just teach myself so much more, so much faster and actually work on things that I'm passionate about by, you know, just getting into the workforce and start building things. So there was a little bit of pushback from my parents, but once they realized, you know, how well I was doing over there, they were completely supportive. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so you're, you're kind of talking a little bit about um, just being really like self-sufficient, it seems. So what would you say are some qualities of somebody who has that self-sufficiency that will, um, e even if they're going to apply it to going to college um, or university, as they call it in Australia, for our um, American listeners here, um, you know, like you could, I feel like self, being self-sufficient is something that, yes, obviously can be very helpful when you're an entrepreneur. Um, but even if you're just like going about your daily life, it's a really great quality to have. So what would you say are like maybe some habits or um, some like descriptors of somebody who ha has those qualities? Oh, it's really, really important, I believe, to be a lifelong learner. It's the most important quality that I've taken on board with me. Um, and I feel like going to uni and going to college is a really important step. And it's a great way to find out what you're really good at and, you know, to get a lot of background knowledge onto, you know, which path you want to take. But once you finish college, that's that shouldn't be the end of your learning journey. You know, technology is changing the, the pace of the market so, so quickly. And everything is changing rapidly. So you also you always need to be able to, um, you know, be on board with what's coming up next and be able to teach yourself new things. So at least from my experience, the way that I learned, um, you know, software engineering was actually through online courses online. So what I did is I enrolled myself into courses from Harvard University and MIT. And I found that, you know, these courses, they, they were free. It was free content. But it taught me everything that I need to know to be able to build the, the solutions that I wanted to build and solve the problems that I wanted to solve. And whenever I need to, you know, pick up a new skill, I always know, know that there is, you know, resources online that I can use to teach myself those new things. Yeah, that's awesome. And I love how you connected that back to technology because uh, the internet, you know, my parents will even say, Isabel, you have no excuses to get bad grades if you're like a functioning person because you have the internet. Like we had to go and look up in an encyclopedia when we were your age to figure out answers to questions that we have, but you have Google. I'm like, well, yeah, I don't have Google on a test, but I see what you're saying. Um, so yeah, I love that. Um, and then something you mentioned was you have to be on board for what's coming next. And I think that's really great advice because 
you know, like I think especially something that COVID has definitely taught us is like life is very unpredictable. So if like you are on board with what's coming next and you are, sort of have like an adaptable um, mentality about you, that could mm-hmm. really help with um, just kind of going about your daily life, entrepreneur or not. Uh, question, what's on board mm-hmm. next for you? What's on board next for me? Yeah. Well, I mean, at the moment, I'm I I'm actually building out a product that is built for the post-COVID world at the moment. So NWO.ai is actually a technology that can predict global trends. So this is everything from you know geopolitical tension to consumer interests, or even predicting financial markets at the moment, such as we predicted the most recent uh, Bitcoin rally. And we're also able to show that our trends are leading indicators of something like the GameStop rally. So what we do is we actually collect massive amounts of information online and we analyze that using artificial intelligence. So we've set up this company in New York. It's about two years old now. This is what I did after I left SAP. And um, we're really excited to announce our most recent funding rounds. We received three and a half million from some venture capitalists uh, for our most recent seed rounds. So. That's so cool. And, you know, as as the listeners are probably taking away from this is, you know, you didn't start with that much money. It's not like somebody came to you and was like, hi, I don't know you, but I think you're going to be great. You you had to build up from you had to build from the ground up, which is really cool mm-hmm. to see. And I feel like that's really inspiring because mm-hmm. maybe somebody listening here is kind of thinking like, oh, man, I don't I don't have much money. How am I going to start my own um, entrepreneurial adventure? Um, mm-hmm. And you're a great example of somebody who did exactly that so that's cool exactly you have to put in the hard yards at the beginning and then the reward will come at the end yes absolutely well <laughs> speaking of hard work you work very hard and i know that um, just from talking to you uh what are some accomplishments that you've worked really hard on that you're most proud of i think the most the, the accomplishment that i'm most proud of at the moment is just the success of this company that i'm building at the moment You know, as you mentioned, I do work really, really hard in order to get this company up and running. But, you know, it was it was a struggle in the beginning. You know, there was there was highs and there were many lows as well. But if you keep pushing through all those, um, you know, peaks and troughs, eventually you come out the other end with a, a technology or a product or a solution or something that you're really proud of that can actually make a difference in the world. So, you know, just as an example, I. I want to end the big in the beginning of the company. I used to work probably 18 hours a day every single day. I worked very very hard on the on the company, but um, it's starting to you know we're starting to get some inbound leads from some really large companies who are really interested in trialing out our product and using it. So I think that's what I'm most proud of at the moment. That's so cool. So um, when you talk about trialing your product, I noticed on your website there is uh, multiple different places where you can find. Um, a tab that you can click on and figure out, you know, um, how to request a demo. Could you just Mm -hmm. give me a few like inside hints about what a demo would entail? So a demo would entail a, um, a call with the founders in the company and we would be able to walk you through the platform and how it works. So essentially at a high level, the way the platform works is that it's like a search engine. So it's like Google search on steroids. So you can type in any trends in the world, whatever it is that you might be interested in. Maybe you might type in trends in bath bombs, for example. And what it will do is it will analyze the petabytes of information that it has available, and it will be able to surface what the latest trends are in the bath bomb space. So be able to show, you know, what are the next, um, you know, flavors or additives in a bath bomb that people are most interested in and is it trending at the moment what's the best time in the year to launch the next product and also we have location insights as well so we can say that you know this particular city is where you should be focusing your marketing strategies that's so cool i i seriously i can't even th- i feel like that's just like you're on the cusp of like the biggest thing yet because um I mean, as you probably know, there's just so much information out there these days, you know, mm-hmm. on the internet and um, just like everywhere you go. Like, I feel like you're just bombarded with marketing, um, people saying facts, people saying opposite facts and reasons to support those. And it's really great mm-hmm. because it kind of seems like people are really passionate about a lot and like you do have access to a lot of information, but it mm-hmm. seems like uh, your site would be very helpful to some people because you could almost like curate the specific information that you need for yourself on a mm-hmm. platform you can trust, which is super cool. 
Exactly. It's yeah, it's very difficult to be able to pull out the signal from the noise. And there you're right, there is a lot of noise and a lot of fake news on the internet as well. And you have to be able to determine which p- piece of information is useful and which piece of information should be thrown away, which is a very difficult challenge at the moment. Yeah. And that's really cool that you take the time to to um to talk with people that you have your team actually like teaching people how to use the um the technology that you've designed. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's really awesome. And it's really cool, too, that you and your co-founders take the time to actually, you know, walk people through the site and um, talk about the uh, software that you created. That's, that's really awesome. So Imogen, we're actually going to take a really quick music break. But when we get back from the break, we are going to continue talking about your business adventure. In the meantime, while you're listening to the tunes, um, everybody listening should also follow Imogen on Instagram at Imogen Low. All right, everybody, welcome back from the music break. If you're just joining us now, I'm here with Imogen Low, the founder of NWO.ai, and she's telling us about her business adventure. Imogen, thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> of course, you're you're so cool. I, I can't believe that <laughs> you're so young and just doing like such amazing things. That's so cool. Um, so <laughs> I was wondering, you you touched on this very briefly. Um, mm-hmm. What your platform has predicted in the past. Um, Mm -hmm. But maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about um, the details of what you've predicted in the past, and then maybe a couple things that you're predicting in the future. Mm. Okay, so at the moment, what we're just most recently, what we were able to show um, with an 80% confidence is who was going to win the US election. So we're able to analyze the conversations online and be able to show the sentiment um, between each, both candidates and show that with an 80% confidence that Biden was actually going to win the election. Um, at the moment, we've we've got this kind of like little internal hedge funds that we're running. So most of our trend lines are actually leading indicators of uh, what's going to happen in financial markets, particularly smaller stocks. So we're not going to give away too many secrets at the moment, but we definitely can tell so that's definitely an incentive for people to come to your website and um, mm-hmm. figure out maybe if they're going to win a Powerball ticket. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Get it down to like a person about who was going to win. Um, I wonder, mm-hmm. what do you want to predict in the future? Like maybe um, it kind of seems like you could do some really cool like um, like social good for people too. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Well, that's right. Yeah, we have so many different applications of our technology. It's yeah, it can be used for social good. It can be used within the government space. It can be used, you know, to predict um, uprising uh, consumer products as well. So there's so many different applications at the moment. It's really about pinpointing which is the best one to focus on for us. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of doing good, I know that you have um, spoken to some groups of young STEM aficionados, if you will. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about what's that, what that's like to interact with young children and how you mm. move, um, that will then lead to a future of successful STEM. Um. That's right. Yeah, I'm actually really passionate about um, getting women into IT. And the thing that I've noticed is that, so as you mentioned, I've actually been um, volunteering to judge at a, um, a high school IT competition. Um, it's at primary school and high school, so across all grades. And what's really, really interesting to notice is that there are a lot of, um, in the younger grades, there's about a 50-50 split of girls and boys participating in the competition. But as you go up into higher and higher grades, the number of females actually drops significantly until you get to grade 12, when there's usually maybe one or two girls competing against a whole group of boys. And I find that really, really interesting that, you know, while children are young, they still have that curiosity and that desire to create things with technology. But then there's a stigma that's associated with technology, that it's geeky, it's technical, it's for nerdy boys. It's something that girls shouldn't be a part of. And slowly over time, the number of girls actually drops out of the competition. So, you know, I feel like in if if you want to, you know, encourage more girls to enter IT, you need to start at the very beginning. So that's why I like to volunteer at these um, IT competitions. So to really motivate girls to keep staying, keep coming back every single year. 
That's because you know in in large organizations they have all these quotas you know they, they want to reach so many girls within the tech team so many girls within the boardroom but the reality is those girls don't actually exist at the moment if you're trying to hire you know so many girls you're only going to get two percent of the resumes that actually come through who are female so I think you need to start at the very beginning. That's why I like to volunteer at these competitions. Yes, absolutely. That's really cool that you just started the source because like you said, like if you don't, if mm-hmm. there aren't people who have made it to that point where they're ready to get hired, it's great to see companies who are on the lookout for, um, you know, giving females opportunities in the industry. Um, but yeah. if there isn't anyone there, what are you going to do about it? So that, that's really <laughs> cool you kind of tracked it back. Um, it seems like it's almost like... Um, predicting a trend in itself and trying to (laughs) figure out something that you can do so that maybe the negative trend doesn't become a trend and that we have more females in IT, which is super awesome. (laughs) Yeah, it would be nice. And something you mentioned also um, was you saw that that creativity was very prominent in um, Mm -hmm. young children, you know, not uh, females or males in specific, Mm. but you've just noticed that that age group is very, um, I think it was fifth grade. Like about yeah, yeah, that age group is very creative and they're very curious as well. And I feel like curiosity is something mm-hmm. that if you can keep that with you as you go mm-hmm. throughout your life, that kind of goes back to um, for being on board with what's coming with your life as well. Because if you're if you have that curiosity, I feel like that kind of um, motivates you to be a little bit more uh, proactive in what you're doing and mm. resourceful. Um, and I think yeah. if you can teach young people to be curious about something, then they can kind of carry that through with them for the rest of their lives. And um, something mm. can come from that. That's right. You always need to have that creative confidence and that curiosity to solve real problems. I know that a lot of entrepreneurs, at least in my experience, I've seen that they get really excited about a technology, for example, and then they try and find an application for it. They try, they take, they find some amazing algorithm or some amazing technology and they try and find a problem to solve with it. But I think that that's the wrong approach when you're building a business. What you should be focusing on is actually finding a problem that you yourself are experiencing and then try and find a solution for that. And that comes back to this, you know, this creative confidence that you have the confidence to find the solution with whatever tools you have available to you. And technology, I find, is such a powerful tool to solve these problems in really creative ways. And that's why I'm so passionate about the field. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree. You know, I feel like sometimes people, um, I love, first of all, that people are trying to uh, solve problems. But I think that when businesses are most successful, um, and then this would also be good advice for somebody who is listening and trying to think about, like, how can I start a business? I don't know what it's going to be, but I want to start one. Mm-hmm. Think of a problem mm-hmm. that you have yourself, just like you said. And then if you can think of a way to solve that problem, chances are other people probably have that problem as well. So then all of a sudden you have a business concept. And I think that that's much more um, productive than trying to imagine a problem that people have and then trying to imagine mm-hmm. a solution because then all of a sudden you're further back because you don't even know if people have that problem in the first place. So, you know, that's something that how I started my business. Um, my sister and I, we were taking baths and our bath, the bath bombs that we were using just weren't doing it. They were staining our skin in our bathtub. And then we decided that we were going to make our own bath bombs. And all of a sudden all of our friends were loving them. We'd bring them to birthday parties and stuff. And our little brother, even like I mentioned earlier, loved the bath bombs. And then all of a sudden, um, we were in 14 stores in our local area. And oh, okay, there was a little more work in between that. It wasn't all of a sudden, but <laughs> you get the point. Um, so I think that that's something really important that you're talking about here. Yeah, exactly. I actually have a similar story. When I was um, when I was about 14, I started a perfume store. So I started creating perfumes at school and selling them to all of my friends. And it was so much fun. But I actually, um, I actually got in trouble by the, by the principal because apparently you're not supposed to sell things at school. So I decided to set up a trading business instead where I would trade ingredients for, for perfumes. But I think that's where my, um, my entrepreneurial spark started was back in primary school when I was making perfumes for all my friends. That's awesome. I mean, it, it seems like it, just, it, it's always been with you. Um, do you believe that entrepreneurship is something that you're born with or do you think it's something that you can learn? I definitely think it's something that you can learn. I think that if you have the, the drive and desire to get out there and solve a real problem that you're, solve, that you're experiencing, then 
Absolutely, you can learn how to do that. I think that some people have are born with an inherent knack to, you know, solve, solve problems. But I think absolutely anybody can have that entrepreneurial spirit mm-hmm. if they put their mind to it. Absolutely. And I think that that's something, too, that I often think about. I'm like, how do you necessarily define the entrepreneurial spirit? Because I feel <laughs> like that the definition could be so many different things. So I think mm-hmm. that it's definitely something that you can learn because you may maybe learn about that you have that entrepreneur per, entrepreneurial spark inside of you, or maybe you just mm-hmm. start to learn how to solve problems and then you start to realize that you've just taught yourself how to be an entrepreneur, which is really awesome. Yeah, I think that they need a lot, a lot more encouragement within at least school um, to start giving children opportunities to solve these problems and then start building small businesses. Because I feel like when you go to school, you know, you, you're given a you're given an assignment, and there's a very clear way to solve to to do that assignment. You know, you have to implement this and that and that. But I feel like there's not much um, creative potential and creative movement within the school space to be able to create things that you know give you an opportunity to solve real problems so I think that there's a lot of change that can be made I agree I would have to say like I did half days at school during high school and that (laughs) exponentially helped me um Mm -hmm. on my business but the reason that I felt like I needed to do half days just because I just I felt like I I was learning the basics, but there just wasn't enough um, creativity in there for me. Um, Mm. You know, there was choir and there was art class, but I just, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to get more real life experiences. So I definitely think that um, school should implement more real life experiences. Um, Mm. Also, just kind of going along the lines of being like innovative and changing things. Mm -hmm. It seems like you've always, you know, been like a self-starter and, uh, you have this view on like how Mm -hmm. can um, schools be a little bit more innovative. How would you say that you've been an innovative um, Mm -hmm. person in the tech industry uh, for females? For females. Oh, of course. Well, I think um, I had, I had so many great opportunities while I was working at SAP because I got the opportunity to, you know, work in the innovation team at SAP so essentially what we were doing is that we would be able, we would have two weeks, we would be able to put together a new product that we could start demonstrating to clients. And it was really about showing the art of the possible of what you can do with technology. So one of the ideas that I had was to actually create this augmented reality application. So essentially what it was, was that it was a mirror that you can look at and you go up to the mirror and you can actually say to the mirror, oh, I, um, I'm going out tonight and I'm wearing a red dress and I'm going on a date and I'm going to a restaurant. And what it will actually do is it will analyze your conversation and it will analyze your face and it will actually apply makeup to your face in the mirror. And you can say, oh, I don't really like that color. You can change the color left or right. You can say, I want it more purple. I want my eyeshadow to be this color. And um, what it will do is that when you like the, the products that are on your face, it is actually give you the products um, so that you can actually purchase them. So I felt that this is a really interesting way to be able to, you know, encourage women in IT because it can show you that there's actually some really interesting applications that you can apply with technology. And there's some really fun, you know, projects that you can work on, such as augmented reality, applying makeup to your face. It's not this geeky, nerdy culture that everyone associates IT to be with. It's actually an opportunity to really create and, you know, build products that you would actually want to use yourself. That's so cool. And that's just like, that's, that's refreshing to hear too, because I feel like all the time people are focusing on um, sort of like the geeky aspect of being into technology. And like, even my little brother, he's like obsessed with video games, but then to go and see that technology can also be applied to, um, you know, generally feminine femininely um skewed practice Mm -hmm. that's really cool to see yeah I was I was never a gamer surprisingly I found that when I was a when I went to to uni all of all of my friends there they all came from a gaming background I said why do you want to do IT and they said because I'm a gamer I want to build games and I'm like that's not me I can't relate to really anybody here so I found it really hard to make friends when I was at at uni it's so there wasn't really much 
you know, encouragement for me to stay there. Mm -hmm. And I can understand it too. I feel like a lot of the time that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the school, you're kind of expected to fit into a box. Um, And it's Mm. hard to fit into that box if you feel like you have some uh, maybe like different aspirations from other people there. Um, And that just, that just kind of goes back to what we were talking about. Like, I think schools should definitely maybe like foster um, people's creative ambitions a little bit more than they currently do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. absolutely absolutely so um you didn't play video games in your free time um what do you do in your yeah. free time um I think my favorite thing to do because I'm sitting down all day coding um I like to get outdoors and I like to do a yoga class or a Pilates class and I like to go for a run or a swim and you know I like to stay fit and healthy that's what I usually like to do with my spare time I love it I'm really into into hot yoga at the moment is my favorite thing to do. Oh, and I know it's summer in Australia right now. So mm-hmm. um, it's, I'm in Minnesota. So um, it, I'll pull up the weather right now. It is, it's five degrees. <laughs> no, I don't know what it translates to you in um, Celsius, but in Fahrenheit, that's really, really, really cold. <laughs> That does sound very, very cold. It's a bright, sunny day, actually, for me. And um, I'm at my, my dad's beach house, so I'm going to go jump in the in the water after this. Oh, my gosh. I'm, I'm, what I wouldn't <laughs> give to be there right now. That's so fun. Well, Imogen, thank you so much for talking to, to me today. I seriously so appreciate having you on. And I hope that every single girl and every single um, kid and even, like, adults are listening to this going, Man, I think I'm going to start pursuing my passions and um, not look at what I think something is as what it actually is. So that's super cool. Thank you so much for being on Build a Biz with me here today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time talking to you. Yes. And everyone should go to nwo.ai and try to predict the next um, stock market exchange. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Thank you. All right, so for those of you who are still listening, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, Imogen's story was so cool, and if you want to listen to it again, you should definitely go to the Build a Bear uh, YouTube channel, and all the past episodes will be posted on there, so you can check some of those out too. And um, definitely follow me on Instagram. My Instagram is isabel.burka, and you can also follow the Build a Bear Instagram um, and the Build a Bear Radio one. Uh, we will all be posting updates on there about the latest radio shows that will be coming out. Um, and I'm so looking forward to sharing another story with you next week. Until then, bye!